got your Bibles and want to open up to the book of Job, we're going to be bouncing around a good bit today, but uh, that's where the Lord has us planted for another Sunday together. Can we pray together as we get started? Father, we come before you and we just ask that your will would be done in this place. Father, that this time would honor and glorify you as we open up your word together. May you speak to us in mighty and magnificent ways. Father, we pray that your power, Father, that your will, that your majesty, and that your goodness would be among us as we worship you during this time. We ask this now in Jesus' name, amen. If you were with us last week, you know that I asked you the question, have you ever asked God the question, why? Specifically, why do bad things happen to good people? We spent our time last week looking at primarily Job chapter 4, but Job 4 and 5. And in those chapters, we find Job's friend, Eliphaz, who speaks up for the first time at some length and offers his theological assessment as to why these things are happening to Job, who by all accounts, by biblical accounts, is a good man and yet finds himself facing so many bad things all at once. Eliphaz comes to the conclusion, his understanding at the time brings him to the conclusion of what we now call retribution theology. And this isn't just Eliphaz's conclusion, by the way. I mentioned multiple times last week. This is actually the conclusion of all three of Job's friends who speak up throughout the course of the book of Job. They all conclude and spend the next 20 plus chapters telling Job why these bad things are happening to him in his life. And it all comes back to retribution theology. We spent a lot of time unpacking that and defining it last week. But for those of you who weren't with us, if you missed last week, here's the quick recap. Retribution theology basically says that bad things happen to good people because they're actually bad people. In other words, God gives you what you deserve. That's what retribution theology teaches. You reap what you sow, and because you're a bad person, you're getting what you deserve when bad things happen to you. You can read how Eliphaz does that in places like Job 4 and 5, which we unpacked last week. You can see how Job's other friend, Bildad, does it in Job chapter 8. You can read how his third friend, Zophar, does it in places like Job 11. And again, they spend 20 plus chapters taking turns, taking shots at Job, and taking shots at asking or answering this question of why. And all of Job's friends basically say, Job, you're getting this because you deserve it. You must have done something bad. You must have done something wrong. God is punishing you for the wrong things that you've done. And all the while, Job continues to defend himself, and he remains, during this time, unwaveringly faithful to God. I love what Job says in Job chapter 13, verses 2 through 5. He says, everything you know, I also know. In other words, I know myself pretty good, guys. I know myself even better than you know me. Everything you know, I know. He says, I'm not inferior to you, yet I prefer to speak to the Almighty and argue my case before God. This is where we're going to pick up next week, by the way. We're next week, the title of the message is When God Speaks. Because we've heard Job speak, and we've heard Eliphaz and his friends speak. Next week, we're going to hear God speak. But Job here says, hey, I prefer to speak to God about this. But look at verse 4. He says, you use lies like plaster. You're just trying to cover over the real issues. He says, you're all worthless healers. And in verse 5, perhaps the most pointed, practical, and, and positively astounding statement in the entire book of Job. He says, if only you would shut up and let that be your wisdom. Just keep your mouth shut, and I would be better off. And this really it goes right along with our big idea for last week, which is also our big idea this week. Again, if you weren't here last week, our big idea is this, 
having the correct answer is more important than having an answer. You see, we, we know that Job didn't do anything wrong. We know that Job didn't do anything to deserve all that has happened to him because we have the context of Scripture. We can go read Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. We can hear God describe Job as a faithful, righteous, upright man of integrity. We have a glimpse into the eternal conversations that happen between God and Satan over this whole situation, but his friends didn't. His friends didn't know any of what we know. I told you last week that that's important because like Job's friends, we don't see everything. We don't know everything. We don't hear everything that is discussed and fought over in celestial eternal realms. So when we see someone suffering, we better be sure we know what the right answer is before we offer an answer. Because we don't know everything, we don't see everything, we don't hear everything. So when, when there's a natural disaster that hits one city and not another, who are we to say why that happened unless we know what the answer is? Or when a famine strikes a country, who are we to pronounce judgment or cast our opinions on the situation if we haven't seen or know or heard everything? We ended last week by saying that if, if, if we wanted to be faithful disciples, and if we really truly want to give the correct answer to people when they have these questions, these hard questions of why, like the question, why do bad things happen to good people, if we really want to give the right answer, we have to have the faithful perspective, was our last point last week, not a flawed theology, faulty opinions, or false conclusions, which were our first three points. That's really what Eliphaz offered up, right? A flawed theology. He offered faulty opinions and a false conclusion, not a faithful perspective. And I told you last week that this week we were going to talk specifically about how we, as faithful disciples, can have a faithful perspective and stay, stay centered as God's people whenever it comes to the questions of why. I told you there were going to be eight points, but I've actually uh, condensed three of them down into one point so that we only have five for today because I knew y'all didn't want to be here for an hour and a half and because we can still get the point across for those three, which I'll explain in a moment. But if, if you want to have the faithful perspective, I think there are five areas of your life that have to be centered. The first one is this. The faithful perspective of a faithful disciple is always going to be a biblically centered perspective. When you're attempting to answer these big why questions of life, your answer should be, must be, grounded in the Word of God. If your answer is not biblically centered, then I can promise you it's the wrong answer. This is why here at Cowboy Fellowship, we are always encouraging you to read the Word of God, to study the Word of God, to memorize the Word of God, to share the Word of God, to make the Word of God the center of your life. Because a faithful disciple who's going to bring a faithful perspective to any situation is going to be somebody who is biblically centered. When you need an answer for the big why questions in life, it should always be a biblically centered answer. 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us that all scripture is inspired by God and that all scripture is profitable to all situations and scenarios of our life. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, the writer says this about the Word of God. He says, For the Word of God is living and effective. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Think about how the Word of God is described there. It's described as being living and active in some translations or effective in others. It's, it's described as being sharp and penetrating. The Word of God is able to accurately judge the thoughts and 
and the intentions of the heart. I'm telling you, church, what we need to be centered on is the Word of God. When you need to know the answer to a hard question in life, a biblically centered answer will lead you to the right answer. I love what Psalm 19 says about God's Word. It says, starting in verse 7, the instruction, the Word of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, warned by the word of God. And in keeping them, there is an abundant reward. This is why I'm telling you, your response, my response, a faithful perspective of a faithful disciple is going to be a biblically centered response or perspective. I could keep going, but we don't have enough time to keep going with all the verses that there are. But hopefully you can see from these few examples how important the word of God should be for any response of a faithful disciple. Point number two is this, your response, my response, the response of a faithful disciple offering a faithful perspective to the big why hard questions of life is going to be a God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit centered response. There's so much that I could say about these three. I was going to deal with all three of them separately, but as I prayed about it and as I thought about it, I, I really came to the conclusion that the lesson for all three is the same, so we can deal with them as one. But I do want to acknowledge that these are all three, actually three different people, three different points, three different persons. That's why I told you last week originally we were going to have eight points today. So I don't want to give you the impression that I'm just lumping them together for the sake of time. I'm really not. We're combining them because the lesson from all three is the same. When it comes to the Holy Trinity, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our response to the big why questions of life should incorporate their perspective on the matter. If we want to have a faithful perspective, we need to be presenting the Trinitarian perspective of the matter. The response that we offer to the big why questions of life, however, are not generally centered on God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit's perspective of the matter. Instead, we tend to make our perspective rise to the surface and we suppress the biblically centered, trinitarianly centered perspective. See, church, here's, here's the temptation. We, we want to center our answer on other things because it's, it's easier to explain and it's more comfortable most of the time. For example, we want to make our, our, our answer centered on three other things in particular. These aren't the only three things, but these are the three things I see the most. The three things I think we have time for. I think we gravitate to these the most, right? The first one is this. We, we tend to gravitate not to the Trinitarian response to the answer, but to the self-centered response to the answer. We don't really attempt, when, we, when we're faced with these big why questions of life, we don't really attempt to be biblically centered or to find the faithful perspective in the Trinitarianly centered response of what does God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit think about it, as much as we offer the response of what makes sense to us. We offer a self-centered response. We make the problem about us or the problem about somebody else. We make the solution about us or about somebody else. Over and over and over again, we see this in the book of Job. We see Job's friends doing this exact thing. They, they tell Job, this is all your fault. They tell Job, this is about his sin. They tell Job this is all centered around him. It's a self-centered, self-righteous response. They go even further, and they, they put themselves at times above Job. They say, you know, I'm glad I'm not like you, buddy, because this would probably happen to me too. Their comments and their concerns are not really God-centered. 
their comments and their concerns are really all self-centered. That's not a faithful perspective. Before you and I ask or look at things from our point of view, we should ask, where is God in this? Where is Jesus? Where is the Holy Spirit? What what does God have to say about this? What does the Holy Spirit have to say about this? What does Jesus have to say about whatever is going on? If we want to offer the faithful perspective, if we want to be faithful disciples, we've got to avoid the temptation to think that everything's about us. We have to have a Trinitarian perspective about whatever the situation is. Here's the next huge temptation. We are oftentimes tempted to offer up what I would call the emotionally centered perspective. The emotionally centered perspective isn't always self-centered. It can be but it's an emotionally centered response. When bad things happen to good people, and we're asking these questions of why, many times our effort is not to find the right answer. Our effort is to find the answer that'll make everybody feel the best, the quickest. Because those questions, those big why questions of life are emotionally draining in our lives, and and, and our, our instinct is to stop the pain not give the right answer. Rather than having a Trinitarianly, biblically centered response, we just go to an emotionally centered response. In other words, we, we don't really want to understand or offer the right perspective to the situation as much as we just want to help others feel good about whatever the situation is, whatever's happening to them. We're offering an answer, but it's not the correct answer. We're offering an explanation, but it's not the right explanation. It's an explanation that makes us feel good. It makes us emotionally happy, but it's not the right explanation. Let me give you some examples. And these are just big, obvious examples that are are easy to pick on and, and quick to explain. And before I say them, let me just say, I know people who offer these are good people. I know they're well-meaning people, I, I, because, and I'm saying this because I know some of y'all are going to think, well, I said that. But, but I really mean this. I know you say it out of the goodness of your heart. I know you say it sincerely and genuinely because you want to help. So I'm not, I'm not standing here in judgment over you in this. I'm just I'm pointing out how easy it is to fall into this temptation to offer an emotionally centered response versus a faithful perspective and a Trinitarianly, biblically-centered response. So take, for example, when somebody dies. When somebody dies, many times I will, I will hear people say this, I will see people say this, I'll even see people post these kinds of things on Facebook. They'll say something like, and maybe you've said some of these things, they'll say something like, he or she gained their angel wings today. That's an emotionally centered response. Or they'll say something like, I guess God needed them more than we did. Or they'll say something like, heaven's a better place now that they're there. Now all of those things, listen church, I get it, all of those things make us feel better. All of those things are an emotionally centered effort to comfort someone in their time of grief. I get it. But you know what else those things are? Flawed theology, faulty opinions, and false conclusions. It's not a faithful perspective. Because church, we don't become angels when we die. The Bible's very, very, I mean extremely clear about what angels are and what we are. And we're not angels and we never become angels. And church, I mean, I hate to burst your little bubbles, but God doesn't need any of us for anything. Not a one of us. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need any of us. It is his grace that brings us into his kingdom. Praise God. He adopts us as his children, but that's not because he needs us. It's because he desires to live in a relationship with us out of his love for us. We love because he first loved us. 
God doesn't need us. How self-centered and emotionally centered are we to think that heaven is going to ever be a better place because we arrive there? You see what I'm saying? When we think about it outside the context of that moment where we're grief-stricken, we, we chuckle about it and we laugh because we, we see how flawed that is, how flawed that theology is, how dangerous that false opinion is and that false conclusion is. But in the moment, we're, we're tempted and we're quick to run to something that is just nothing more really than an emotionally centered response to a big question of why. We could go on. I mean, there's thousands of different ways we do this and we respond emotionally to situations. But my, my point is really just this. Instead of making things emotionally centered, our effort as faithful believers and faithful disciples who want to bring a correct and faithful response to a situation where these big why questions of life are happening should be not emotionally centered, but biblically and Trinitarianly centered. Where is God? Where is Jesus? Where is the Holy Spirit in this? That's a harder thing to pull out. That's a harder thing to digest. But that's what a faithful disciple does. They don't just offer an answer. They offer the right answer. The third one is that we oftentimes will gravitate to what I call a convenience-centered response. You see, the goal of a faithful perspective is always to give the correct answer, not just an answer, not just the most convenient answer, but most of the time we're too busy or too lazy or we just don't know what to say, and so we just latch on to whatever is comfortable and convenient at that moment in time. Job's friends do this. They do this over and over and over again. Most of their responses are very, very convenient for them. It's why Job tells them things like this in Job 16, 2 through 5. He says, I've heard many things like these. You are all miserable comforters. Is there no end to your empty words? What provokes you that you continue testifying? If you were in my place, I could also talk like you. I could string words together against you and shake my head at you. And instead, I would encourage you with my mouth and the consolation from my lips would bring relief. Job's, Job's point here is if the, the roles were reversed, he's saying, I could do the same thing. I could grab on to all these easy and convenient arguments and accusations that you're making against me, and I could point every single one of those right back at you if our roles were reversed. Because we as people, we're quick to go to what's convenient and comfortable. But we've got to remember, even though those things are convenient, they're not really caring. Because if we give somebody the wrong answer, do we really care about them? And even though they're convenient, they're definitely not correct. And yeah, they're convenient, but they're not constructive. And yes, they're, they're convenient, but they're definitely not spiritually conclusive and aren't going to lead anybody into a deeper faith with the Lord because it's not a faithful response, a faithful perspective. So when we make our responses to people, rather than searching for what's most convenient in the moment, we should be searching for what's correct and what's right. Because the only way we're truly going to ever help anyone is if we give them the right answer, not just an answer. So again, our, our goal in all matters should be to help ourselves and to help others see where God is, where Jesus is, where the Holy Spirit is moving in the situation, what their perspective on the matter is as we offer a biblically-centered, Trinitarianly-centered response. The third one is this, it should be gospel-centered. Any response you give should be a gospel-centered response. Now, for New Testament believers like us, this seems like, like it should be obvious. However, so many times when we approach these big, major, why questions of life, as disciples, for one reason or another, we fail to find a way to be gospel-centered. Now, Job's three friends, they have a really good excuse. They didn't know the gospel. So we can't judge them or blame them for this. They, they didn't know the gospel, but we do. And as a result, the unwavering 
and faithful disciple of today is going to have their response be centered on the gospel. The gospel is going to be at the center of every part of their life and every part of their response. Especially when we're trying to minister to those who are suffering, minister to those who have faced tragedy, minister to those who are asking these big why questions of life. Lord, forgive us if our response is not gospel-centered. And church, we're not the first and the only people that have been commissioned to be gospel-centered people. We're not the only people that God has called to be gospel-centered whenever these big why questions come about. Let me just give you two examples for the sake of time. When you don't have a lot of time, you just go to the best examples first. So we're going to start with Jesus. There's no better example than Jesus for anything. Look at Mark chapter 1 with me. Mark 1, 14 and 15. It says this, after John was arrested, this is John the Baptist, after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. He says, repent and believe the good news. So think about this. John the Baptist is a big deal. He was a big deal. He's the forerunner of Christ. This is all divinely orchestrated by God. And at this particular point in time, Large crowds are coming to hear John the Baptist preach. Large crowds are coming to hear John the Baptist proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Large crowds are coming to hear John the Baptist and, and, and to have him baptize them. The religious leaders are watching John the Baptist at this point in time in history. They're watching him with a close eye. They're coming out to listen to him and to hear him. John, at this point, John the Baptist, has his own disciples who are following him and learning how to do ministry from him, and they're faithfully helping him do this ministry. And at this point in time, as far as popularity goes, John the Baptist is a much bigger deal than Jesus. I mean, Jesus takes a journey out into the wilderness to go find John the Baptist and to be baptized by John. This was the will of God. This pleased God, the scripture says. But then, sometime after that, John gets arrested, and ultimately, John the Baptist is beheaded and killed. Only because he was a follower of God. That was his crime. Because of who he was and what he was doing, he got arrested and he was martyred for his faith. Now, you know people in that day were looking at that situation and going, why? Why did such a bad, tragic thing happen to such a good man? Why is this bad thing happening to this good man of God? Why would God let somebody that he was using in such a spectacular way suffer in such a horrible way? It's an obvious and fair question. But I want you to look and see what Jesus did, because this is the faithful perspective at work. It says, after John was arrested, what happened? Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. He went and shared the gospel. That's what he did, because that is the faithful perspective. It's a gospel-centered perspective, not a John-centered perspective, a gospel-centered perspective. So while people were asking that question, Jesus said, I'm going to go out and share the gospel, leaving a model for us in those moments in our lives. Here's another great example. Again, there's so many we could look at in the Bible, but this one in Acts 8, I think, is a great one as well. Look in Acts 8, verses 1 through 4. It said, Saul agreed with putting him to death, talking about Stephen, the first martyr for our faith. And on that day, it says a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. And then it says, devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, verse 3, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men and women, and put them in prison. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. People are dying, y'all. People are being torn away from their homes, torn away from their children, torn away from their spouses, torn away from their families, 
People are being thrown into prison. The church of God, this young, fragile, little New Testament thing, is according to scripture being ravaged. The people of God are being ravaged. And their only crime is that they're followers of Jesus. Their only crime is that they have trusted God in faith and trusted Jesus as their Savior and Lord. These are good people doing good things. These are godly people doing godly things. These are peaceful people doing peaceful things. And they're dying for it and suffering for it. And you know it would be so easy for them and so obvious for them to say, why us? Why is God letting this bad stuff happen to us? Why would God let his children be treated this way? Why would God let this man Saul destroy his church? He he said the gates of hell wouldn't overcome it, and now a man is destroying it. Why? But that's not a faithful perspective. It's not what they did. Instead, it says they're gospel-centered people. Look at what they do. Verse 4. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Church, in the good times and in the bad times, in the easy times and in the hard times, in the situations that make sense and in the middle of the mess and the chaos that brings confusion to our lives, when everything is going right and when everything is going all wrong, no matter what, Our response as faithful disciples and a faithful perspective is going to be a gospel-centered perspective. I pray that we would be able to stand as Paul was able to in places like Romans 1.16 and say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew and also for the Greek. That's a gospel perspective. Jesus commanded us in Mark 16, 15, to go into all the world, he says, and preach the gospel to all creation. That is a gospel-centered command and commission that is placed upon the shoulders of every disciple who calls him Lord. That's not a command or a commission just when we feel like it. It's not a command or a commission when life makes sense. It's not a command or a commission only when things are comfortable and easy It's not a command or a commission that's only there when we're healthy and happy. It's not a command or commission that's only applicable when we have money in the bank and a little extra to spare. It's not a command or a commission that's only there when our marriage is strong. The faithful perspective is a gospel-centered perspective all day, every day, until the very end of all of our days. We are commanded, called, and commissioned by God to have everything in our life centered on the gospel. And having a correct answer is more important than having an answer. And can I just tell you, I've never been in, seen of, or heard of a situation where the gospel of Jesus Christ was not the correct answer. So church, don't just give people an answer. Give them the right answer. And his name is Jesus. Now I want to mention these last two things very quickly. And if you're a gospel-centered person, a biblically-centered person, and a Trinitarianly-centered person, these next two take care of themselves. They happen naturally in our lives, but I think they're very important. and, And I think we need to pull them out and we need to at least mention them before we close. The fourth one is this, we need to, as people of a faithful perspective, we need to be hope-centered. We need to, when we're helping answer these big why questions of life, we need to offer a response that is centered on hope. Because there's no greater hope than the gospel. The Apostle Paul correctly says, or the Apostle Peter correctly says in 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. He says, you are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. 
Church, there is no greater hope in all the world than the hope that is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And can I just tell you, because hope is tied to the gospel, that makes hope eternal. Hope is eternal. Hope brings power and provision to any situation, especially those that are related to these big, hard, why questions of life. So as faithful disciples, we should approach those who have these questions with hope. When somebody you know has these questions, when somebody you love has these questions, when somebody you work with has these questions, when your teenager or your children have these questions, the faithful perspective is always going to be a hopeful one. I love what Paul told the Romans in chapter 15. In chapter 15, starting in verse 13, he says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In all of his struggles and questions, Job remained unwaveringly faithful to God. And I think in part that's because he remained centered on hope. If you haven't read the book of Job, I pray that you would before this series is over in a few weeks. I pray you'd read the book of Job from start to finish. And as you do, I I want you to see how even though these friends are not being faithful in their perspective, there's this hope in Job. He has this hope in God. This hope in God alone. And praise God he did, because if he wouldn't have, he would have faltered and failed. But he stands there unwaveringly faithful to God, I believe because he had this hope inside of him. His hope was not in his family. He loved his family. He grieved when his family was taken from him. His hope was not in his stuff, though he acknowledges all that stuff he had in his life made his life easier, but that wasn't where his hope was. His hope wasn't in his wealth. His hope wasn't in his reputation. Praise God, his hope was not in his friends because they failed miserably. His life and his perspective, however, were centered on the hope of God. And so when we enter into these moments with other people or with ourselves in the darkest of nights, in those quiet moments when we are asking God the question why, we need to firmly hold on to the hope, the eternal hope we find in God. The fifth and final one, this was the one we'll close with, is that, that our response, if it's going to be a biblically sound response, if it's going to be a faithful response, it has to be a, a faith-centered response. Faith is not an easy thing to have. We talk about it. It's easy to talk about. But faith is a hard thing to have, particularly when you're going through a hard situation. But it's a very important thing if you want to have a faithful perspective. And if you're really somebody who's committed to giving people the right answer, not just an answer, you're going to have to have a faith-centered response when you're dealing with these questions. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we're told what faith is. It says, now faith, it's the reality of what is hoped for and the proof of what is not seen. Paul told the Corinthian believers and. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. It was actually the devotion this morning and the, the written devotional that, that I send out to people. I didn't plan it that way. It was written months ago. But we walk by faith and not by sight. If you think that's easy, I challenge you to do this later. Don't do it here. Don't do it now. Do it after you leave the church. I don't want you to sue me. Um, Do it at your own house where your own liability insurance will cover you. We walk by faith, not by sight. If you want to see how hard this is to walk by faith, I dare you to go home and put a a bandana or something around your face and cover your eyes and try to walk around the rest of the day. See how long it is before you rip that thing off because you get so frustrated. For we walk by faith, not by sight. But can I tell you this, church? There's going to come a time in all of our lives at some point or another when we have to do that. When we have to walk by faith and not by sight. 
when we're just going to have to trust God and wholeheartedly walk by faith and not by sight. And there are times in our lives when we see other people suffering, we see other people questioning, we see other people struggling in life, asking these big why questions. And we should not, let me say this again, we should not do what Job's friends did and just spout off an answer or an explanation but we should give them the right answer instead. And part of that right answer is going to be an answer based on faith and centered on faith. We should encourage them to walk in faith and to trust the Lord. No matter what their predicament or problem is, our perspective should always be one of hope and one of faith. If you and I can remain unwaveringly centered on these things, imagine what could happen. Imagine what could happen if we were able to bring a faithful perspective to the kinds of situations we'll face today and tomorrow and this week and in the months to come. Imagine how much good, how much power, how much love, how much hope could spring from a congregation this size if we were just faithfully centered ourselves. Imagine if no other church did it, if no other Christian in the whole world did it, but if we all did it, if we did it together, imagine if, if we all just said, you know what? We're not gonna give an answer, we're gonna give the correct answer. And if I don't know the correct answer, I'm just gonna shut up and let that be my wisdom. I'm not just going to offer an answer anymore. I'm going to offer the correct answers and be faithful in that. Imagine what could spring up just from a congregation our size if we were all committed to being biblically centered, trinitarianly centered, gospel centered, hope centered, faith centered. You talk about a dangerous church to the devil. I want to close just by saying this. Maybe your life is a little off-center right now. Maybe you walked into this place and you know you needed to get right with the Lord. Maybe you've never been forgiven of your sins. Maybe you've never repented of your sins and confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and therefore you're not a disciple of Jesus. I have good news for you today as we close. I have a faithful perspective for you to consider comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8. It says this, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift. It's not from you, it's from God. You're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The good news for you today, if you are off-centered, if your life is out of whack, if you are carrying that sin around with you, is that God sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you, that he offered him as a sinless lamb, as a sacrifice for you, so you could be saved, so you could be forgiven, so you could have your name written in the Lamb's book of life in heaven and so that you could re-enter into a personal relationship with him. That is good news today. This good news is available for everybody. There's nothing you can do. There's no sin you can commit that is greater than the grace of God. There's no sin you can commit that is outside the power and the atonement of the blood of Jesus. So no matter who you are and where you've been and what you've done or who you've done it with, or whatever guilt you carry in your heart, this good news is for you. For you, for you, for you are saved by grace through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's not from this church. It's God's gift to you. And I pray you would unwrap that gift. I pray you would believe and confess and repent this day and be saved. Let's pray. If you're here this hour, we're not going to ask you to raise a hand, walk an aisle, come stand up here on the front and be introduced to everybody. We're just going to ask you in faith to believe, to confess, to repent.
that's you, you do your business with God there in the silence of your own heart. Follow me in this prayer. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So, Lord, today I ask by faith that you would forgive me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new, that you would wash me clean. I repent of my sins and confess you as my Lord and Savior. I thank you for your gift, Lord, your gift of grace for the power of the gospel and for the salvation you have brought to me. Father, as we close this hour, we thank you and praise you for those you have called unto yourself this day. Lord, I pray they would live faithfully with you and walk with you in the days to come. Lord, I pray for each and every one of these faithful people who have arrived here on this morning where they had other options, they had other places they could go, other things they could do, but they said, no, I'm going to worship God this morning. I'm going to honor my King and my Lord. I'm going to make the space and the time to be with His people in His house, Lord. I pray that you would honor that. And Lord, I pray that as we have spoken of this faithful perspective, that they would carry it to the world, to the nations. Lord, I pray that we would no longer be content with just having an answer. Lord, that we would never be satisfied unless we can speak up with boldness and assurance that we have the right answer. Lord, may you use these people for your glory and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.